I actually took, uh, picked the topic up similarly as Fred did. I didn't want to speak about challenges uh, or uh, emerging, the emerging trends. I felt more comfortable to talk about what we actually have seen in 2013, and I think that was very, uh, very interesting. And some of this probably points to um, emerging trends. I've just been told that I have to be very brief with my presentation, so uh, I will skip through most of it and. Uh, go over some of the slides. Some of the things have already been said, anyhow. Um, Tim mentioned this morning the conference that we had in Brussels um, uh, in to mid-2013. And uh, I think uh, one, one of the things that became clear that uh, Europe, while it entered the whole MOOCs uh, issue uh, very late, uh, it is quickly catching up. I put here a slide on the growing uh, Coursera participation. And what you can see here is that there were 50 non-US uh, universities on it in November, uh, among them 28 European universities. And if you look uh, more into detail, in that period, the whole growth from Coursera came, in fact, from outside Europe. So there was not a single US university uh, which joined the Coursera. I think that's an interesting aspect to understand uh, how this whole topic is emerging. In autumn 2012, we asked members in a survey, uh, have you heard about MOOCs? Have you discussed them? And what we learned, 67% uh, had not discussed them. When we asked them now last autumn, uh, we found out that 75% have a position, institutions have a position now on MOOCs or are developing one. Um, and we could also see that from the European platforms about, uh, uh, Fred talked already about it, so more and more platforms have been developed. And uh, if we look at the overall picture, there are some 400 uh, MOOCs currently pr provided by Europe. Just briefly, three things that MOOCs cannot do. It has been quoted several times. Uh, I just wanted to make here the point. Uh, Sebastian understood that this is somehow about the human element which plays a role there. Uh, he, he could have read this somewhere, couldn't he? I mean, before starting Udacity. Um, and many people have told him, actually, but he didn't want to hear. There must be a, a, a very thin borderline between um, being innovative and uh, not listen to public wisdom and to be um, grossly naive and ignorant uh, to what everybody knows already. Um, I think... Uh, Another point that has been made, and I found it interesting that this seems to be everywhere, the, the thing in the world, uh, regardless where, it's the majority of learners have a degree or are going to have one. This is the same in the US. This is uh, the experience of Edinburgh. I think it will be everywhere. Um, another point that has become quite clear, some policymakers have thought this is the solution. Yeah? The MOOCs will solve our problem with mass higher education. It will be cheaper, better quality, uh, uh, and, uh, and with more higher education participation. And the indication is it does not quite this. Um, disruption or transformation, you saw that it went through the media. That was the actual hype, the end of degrees, the tsunami, the avalanche, however you call that. I find that interesting because it puts existing higher education in a particular corner. You look somehow backheaded behind technology, not serving learners properly, not responsive to the labor market, inefficient, old-fashioned, and in some parts this is probably also true, but it's not black or white, and I think this easily is forgotten if uh, the debates about this get so excited at, and about what innovation is. The problem is, I think, really, that we are so far in Europe, we are still laboring from a debate that is taking place in the US, uh, which is very much focusing on technical possibilities and economic revenue prospects of MOOCs but let out somehow the actual learning innovation. And in the previous session, I think we saw some very good, um, thoughtful um, uh, presentations uh, on what uh, it actually means for learning. So this is what we are just uh, approaching. And I think I can skip this one and also this one. So that's more the business side of the, universe, uh, of, of the MOOCs movement. Um, it, 
actually, if you think it from that point, it could eventually become an avalanche. Uh, I mean, if we think about if you would liberalize higher education, make it a tradable service, allow a market to develop, uh, that would be a possibility that you would have drastic and overnight changes in higher education. I don't think that this is likely to happen in Europe at this stage, but I think we have to look uh, very closely at international trade agreements uh, and also uh, on the discussion about the European internal market. And a good uh, argument against this is probably that the US experience with uh, for-profit online providers, which has been a massive development from the end of the 90s on. Uh, there's the Hawkins report, which basically tells you about the problems of dropout quality and high costs, higher costs than uh, traditional universities would charge. At the institutional level, this has already been mentioned. There is, of course, the issue of outsourcing of academic functions, casualization and freelancing of staff, unbundling the budgets, and, and, and. Um, I think these are all issues which are important, and they may, of, for some, be of uh, a, a signal for a positive change, positive innovation. Others find them concerning. I think this will mean change of disruption, but it does not come only from the MOOCs. Um, probably on university and learning innovation, as I said before, that many people think universities are actually not really innovative. And uh, you could argue the MOOCs have been developed by uh, universities. MOOCs platforms are run by people who come from universities, but they have, of course, not been developed in the universities. And uh, a question is whether universities can actually revolutionize uh, uh, learning, and is that actually happening? And if so, does anybody know about it? And a similar, I have here a second strand, is the um, uh, learning innovation that should come from MOOCs. And it has been said here several times, well, we do e-learning since two, three, four decades. We know this already, so it's not brand new. But my question is, does everybody know that? Um, outside the university, but also inside the university. I think what, what is changing at the moment, you have a certain vulgari vulgarization of e-learning, and some people may regret that. Um, but I think the positive thing it is it gets it out of the community, uh, out of the uh, group of the converted, and makes it necessary for vice chancellors, uh, for deans, uh, to confront it and to think about it. Um, and this is very much what a uh, professor at Duke University says, who just started a meta MOOC, where she tries to demonstrate uh, what is the innovation actually that is taking place in higher education learning. And she also makes the point, and I think that's important, that it's not that it doesn't take place, but it's probably often sitting in pockets, and you may have difficulties um, to roll it out and to mainstream it within the institutions. And I think this is an important uh, issue to be taken up with uh, university leadership, and this is what we are going to do as EUA in the uh, coming months. Um, traditional university and e-learning, we thought we could find something on Europe on this in the literature, but we couldn't find any European overview. This is why we ran a survey last year with around 250 responses from 30, 37 countries, so pretty diverse. What you can say, e-learning has arrived everywhere, and I think it's kind of logical. You have so many students and teachers who walk with their tablet computers into the higher education institutions. So everywhere you had a reaction to that. But in many places, it sits at the faculty level. It's individual teachers who drive it. Um, what was surprising for us that 75% of the universities said that they have a strategy for e-learning or they are planned to develop one. Uh, it is considered uh, in also in the governance and management approach. And uh, what has been confirmed, there is a role of individual faculty and individual teachers as innovators. The focus is clearly everywhere on blended learning. This is uncontested. But we think to see a slight uh, drift also towards uh, online provision. What is quite positive is that everybody seems to agree it's good for the whole learning and teaching discussion, not only about e-learning, but about learning and teaching in general. It makes the topic much more prominent, it gives more insight, more information, better discussion, informed discussions. What is not clear, and this is what I found astonishing, uh, things like the 
flipped classroom where you would think this should be something very clearly to, to find out if, whether this works or not or whether it is better learning or not. Uh, but there was no agreement from the respondents on this topic. Um, this one I found that interesting because if you look at the institutional motivations for e-learning, it's about flexible learning, increasing effectiveness of classroom time, provide more learning opportunities for students off and on campus. What it is not about is on internationalization. Now we ask the same institutions also, what is their motivation for MOOCs? Because many of them said that some of them had a MOOC, and many of them said that they are planning to develop MOOCs. And there you can see it's about the opposite. It's, uh, it's really about internationalization at the moment. This is the main uh, reason to do MOOCs. It's increasing international visibility and reputation of the institution, student recruitment, pre-selection, pre um, and a bit also about innovating learning and teaching. Um, this brings us to the last aspect, and I'm not going to read that out, what MOOCs are actually good for. And that's interesting because uh, a lot of people were convinced that we had to do MOOCs, but not many were really able to answer what they were actually for. I think this is always with these kind of uh, innovations. You try it out, you try to find out. But it's a relatively high investment, and so it should have a multiple use and an added value. And I think this is what we are currently trying to discuss with members. It's clear that it is good for internationalization. We heard several statements about this this morning, to brand a European learning offer. Um, would it also work for joint provision uh, with partners around the globe? Um, the other thing, point that has been made, it can also be integrated in regular teaching, so blended learning, flexibilization of learning, and, and, and. But uh, for this, you don't need a MOOC, do you? You can just do blended learning. You don't need a MOOC. So what, what is the purpose of this? Other than you could say we use it for blended learning and also for an international offer uh, um, uh, for adult learners, and, and, and. So the question is, are there is the, the a possibility to use it in multiple ways. And then, of course, the focus on additional learning rather than replacing higher education, I think that has been become quite clear. And surprisingly, in some European countries, there are also pre-MOOC MOOC experiences, I would say. So, particularly in Germany, there have been online courses provided uh, by universities in cooperation with companies for a long period of time. And uh, the last point that I want to make here, what does it actually mean for the European higher education area? I'm sitting also in the uh, Bologna working groups and participate in the ministerial meetings. I can, and I can uh, tell you uh, e-learning, online learning, has been gloriously absent from these discussions over the past decade. Um, no conclusion, an epilogue, an emerging trend from the past. I found that very interesting, this statement. It's from 1924. And it's, it's, very, it's very anticipatory, isn't it? It's provident. At the same time, it looks only on technical possibilities. It doesn't really, I mean, it's true regarding the technical possibilities, but we don't have children running around in the street learning. Yeah, you can learn, uh, 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 of course, via the radio, but it's, the question is to what extent that has been uh, successful. And I think this is exactly the debate that we will continue on the MOOCs and probably on other learning possibilities that we uh, will have in the future. The last is just an advertisement. Uh, we have an annual conference in Brussels in 2014 on changing landscapes and learning and teaching. Um, there is the MOOC Summit upcoming in, uh, uh, not organized by us, but we are uh, supporting that in, at the, in Lausanne. And uh, we launched today the EUA Trends Survey on the developments in European higher education. So your Vice Chancellor should have received the questionnaire today. And the last thing um, that becomes a running gag because I announced that already at my last presentation <laughs> in autumn, but it's, it's really out now this week, and I'm happy to, I will send that to the organizers. We do, uh, we monitor MOOCs in Europe, and uh, it will be on our website, and we can also send that round to everybody. Thank you very much for your attention.